everybody. It's 12.02. I think we'll get started. My name is Lane Donnelly uh, and welcome uh, to the Stanford Medicine Center for Improvement lecture series. Pleasure uh, today uh, to introduce our speakers and uh, colleagues of mine, um, Claudia Algazi and Andy Shin. Introduce them and then let them get started uh, with their presentation. Uh, Claudia is an assistant professor in cardiology, pediatric cardiology, uh, and she is the medical director for our uh, clinic. Uh, Claudia, in that role, uh, helps with many different things, including uh, uh, what you'll hear much about today, our target-based uh, care program. She's one of our leaders for clinical pathway development and helps uh, with uh, utilization review as well. Shin is a professor of pediatrics and PVICU attendings. Um, he is our executive director for innovations and clinical effectiveness uh, within the Center for uh, Pediatric and Maternal Value. Um, and he is really our, one of our main point people for quality in the, our heart center, as well as uh, medical directs um, uh, surf with uh, David Schenker. And Andy have worked on a number of projects. One of the main things is what they'll be talking about target based care, which would affect on helping uh, shorten our both in the ICU and in the hospital in general for uh, primarily surgical patients. Uh, and it has also um, uh, caught the national attention of many uh, they're working on, and I'm sure they'll talk about a, a national collaborative where they're going to introduce target-based care uh, throughout children's hospitals uh, throughout the United States. Uh, so with that, um, uh, thank you and welcome uh, Claudia and Andy. Thanks, Lane. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started uh, and kick us off uh, by sharing our screen. Is everyone able to see this? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for, for taking the time uh, and, and listening to, to our, to our uh, talk here. This is a little bit of a, just kind of a storytelling of, of our journey in terms of how we came about uh, this type of intervention, um, which has kind of gotten a little bit of attention uh, across other institutions um, and are starting to take the initial steps in generalizing this across uh, several academic medical centers. Um, so wanted to kind of provide a little bit of a background story um, and happy to entertain questions either during or after, um, after the talk. Um, I think most of us are probably familiar with this graph or similar graphs like this. Um, but it basically shows that for nearly all of the past uh, several decades, um, spending on healthcare in the United States has grown more rapidly than the economy itself. Um, and as a result, the share of national income devoted to healthcare has nearly tripled. Um, and this ongoing spending growth has pervaded all parts of the healthcare system, including our public, ins public insurance programs. Um, and this chart basically shows healthcare spending in relations to average life expectancy, which is one of many outcome metrics um, that you can replace with, um, which is shedding a distressing light demonstrating that costs are increasing without the benefit of improved outcomes. And US healthcare spending is increasingly losing value. And this could not be more uh, relevant than, than our community, spe specifically at Packard, where you know, we, we have a very expensive uh, cost um, to, to healthcare uh, care, partly driven by the complexity of our patients, um, but, but sometimes that um, the, the cost spending is agnostic to uh, the, the, the complexity equation. And, and ultimately, uh, we're starting to see much more of an existential question about whether or not we can sustain the costs uh, that, that we uh, provide um, and, and does it provide uh, an existential threat to our, to our community and our, and our institution overall. Um, and increasingly, health reform is inseparable from payment reform. Um, economic pressures will continue to accelerate the movement from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. Um, there's uh, no real serious reimbursements for serious preventable adverse events, uh, especially in adults, but now starting to think about it happening in, in children. 
And the new provider incentive really is the better you do as a patient, the better I do as a healthcare provider. Um, so there are many different causes um, and underlying kind of underpinnings related to um, uh, why why this is uh, and why this is a continued problem within healthcare. Um, and one is the fact that there's just uh, well documented um, uh, massive variation in our clinical practice. Um, and as a result, there are also a similar degree of uh, awareness and appreciation of the inappropriate care that, that we tend to deliver. Um, and even when uh, we know what the right thing to do is, um, it's very difficult. And that oftentimes leads to um, unacceptable rates of preventable care-associated injury and death. Um, and with guidelines and evidence-based medicine um, um, becoming much more of a norm, we still have a striking inability to do what we know what works. Um, in fact, I think most of the literature has reported um, our general practice uh, follows national guidelines at best um, about 40% of the time and oftentimes worse than that. Um, and all of this culminates to just significant amounts of waste uh, leading to rising prices. And those rising prices ultimately translates to limits in access to care, especially for patients who are much more disadvantaged. Um, and this becomes uh, one of the most significant burdens in our healthcare delivery for effective care. Um, so we started uh, our journey to try to address this. Um, and we kind of labeled ourselves as trying to be public enemy number one when it comes to variation in care. And we, st we thought that the the, the typical approach, the, the gold standard approach was to develop a pathway. Um, and, and that pathway will help then become the way to standardize the way we take care of patients. Um, so that was the, the premise. And this is the premise that most institutions have really tried to uh, follow. Um, and we, th we thought we started off with our uh, kind of our flagship surgery here at Packard, which is um, patients who have tetralogy of Fallot, which is a congenital heart disease. It's a cyanotic heart disease that requires open heart surgery for repair. And we tend to get referrals from all over the, the world, really, to, to take care of patients like this. Um, then, then we started asking ourselves, you know, how do we perform um, when it comes uh, comparing ourselves to other um, healthcare centers uh, that do perform this type of operations? And this is a report uh, uh, from one of my colleagues, Sarah Pasquale, who started looking at the effectiveness of care and divided cardiac centers performing this type of operations into different tertiles um, based on their performances in length of stay. And you can see those tertiles and their length of stays reflected here. And when we started off on this pathway work to standardize care for patients with tetralogy of Fallot, we found ourselves kind of sitting here in the back of the pack uh, with a uh, length of stay at approximately 12 days uh, for, for this uh, surgery. Um, so engaging in everything that we've learned from CELT and from other uh, programs that help with quality improvement and clinical effectiveness, we um, utilize the standard tools to try to identify what the key drivers and interventions and what the root causes for extended length of stay. Um, we took a look at our baseline data, created run charts, um, and ultimately developed a pathway that's reflected here. It's not meant to be digested, um, uh, but it is a, it's a document that kind of outlines step by step on days um, the patient is recovering from surgery, what to do with diuretics, inotropes, um, ambulation, et cetera. Um, and we came up with this uh, standard kind of uh, approach to taking care of patients with tetralogy of Fallot. And um, like other institutions that have invested in pathway work, it was successful. Um, we uh, brought our total um, time to uh, ex um, time to, uh, on the ventilator and ICU sp uh, days spent and total hospital days spent um, went from pre-interventions to post-intervention improvements. And you can see the median length of stay went from, or the mean length of stay went from that 11.6 days, uh, which was kind of the worst of the worst compared to other centers, to approximately seven days, both mean and median. Um, and if you remember, the best performing tertiles nationally was nine days. And so we went from worst of the worst to the best of the best. And we kind of uh, thought that this was um, inconsistent, uh, very consistent with the literature that pathways do work. 
um, and, and that they're uh, great for helping to standardize care. Um, but what we found uh, was that when we wanted to do this um, and scale this um, uh, in a substantial way, found that um, for, for one pathway, for one surgery, um, it took a lot of planning. And uh, there was a whole process um, that, that went into not only the analysis and the drivers of, of what determined the, the extensive length of stay, but it was an extensive review of guidelines and evidence. Uh, it was identifying uh, clinical champions, uh, trying to coordinate uh, stakeholder teams, analyze the problems together, and then really try to implement it into an environment uh, that required uh, training, communication, coordination, um, and there was implementation issues uh, related to cultural fit, um, uh, limited resources um, for, for us that made things just on an extended timeline. And so it took us about six months to get this uh, one pathway off the ground and running. Um, and and that, that, that makes it a little bit difficult. The other challenge that we had was that most of the time, at least in pediatrics, um, there wasn't a lot of evidence to guide these pathways. Um, in fact, we were much more reliant on expert opinions uh, and we gathered experts from different sections, whether in surgery or ICU or hospital care, um, echocardiography, we would gather the experts uh, and, and, and kind of come up with this pathway of, of what to do, when to do it uh, in managing these patients. Um, what turns out when we tried to roll out pathway work um, that was guided by consensus opinions of experts, we were rolling them out amongst other experts. Um, and I think um, this is true in Stanford, but this is probably this is true in other institutions that most people consider themselves content experts in the field that they're working in. Um, there isn't a single person who considers themselves below average when it comes to their medical training. And uh, this is um, relatively a unique um, uh, phenomenon uh, and observation. And so there was disagreement um, when it came to what the experts considered to be standard care. Um, and I think this makes a whole lot of sense. If, if most of us come from other institutions, um, what's remarkable for me coming from the East Coast to the West Coast was that um, what one institution's dogma is another institution's sin. And there's so much variation in terms of how people are trained um, that, that that makes it very difficult for us to get behind a certain agreed approach uh, to, to taking care of patients. Um, and then introduced to that, that there's a lot of biological diversity. I think one pathway to encapsulate the diversity of training and the diversity of disease makes it, um, makes it a tall order to, to, to really implement on top of that, um, at the time that we were thinking about standardizing care to improve length of stay, um, we were facing um, a major issue when it came to capacity. Uh, we had uh, an unacceptable rate of cancellations due to the fact that we were running at capacity nearly 100% of the time. Uh, and so that made the pressure uh, to try to improve on a faster timeline, uh, much more real for us. And so, so we had to think a little bit differently about how to implement pathways um, or the concept of pathways um, in a much more scalable fashion. Um, and so we, we started asking ourselves, um, well, what, what really matters in terms of the diversity of training and the, and the diversity of healthcare providers? So we started asking providers, what is their expected length of stay um, when taking care of say a patient who has either tetralogy of flow or who underwent an appendectomy or who had a spinal fusion. Um, we started asking kind of um, what their mental construct was when it came to um, and it, uh, their length of stay for those routine type surgeries and found that page, uh, providers were just on very different pages. Um, and, and this was very interesting. Um, and we thought maybe this was an important driver, um, kind of an unspoken driver um, when it came to how patients are managed and the cadence of their management and their recovery, um, perhaps dictated by the fact that there were different mental constructs between the providers. Um, uh, especially when patients are passed from day team to night team or from weekday to weekend, um, as, as the patients are, are passed on to different providers with different mental constructs, um, you may predict that there might be different cadences of recovery that may contribute to variations in how the, the length of stay ultimately uh, performed. 
um, we started asking the same questions to families as well and found that families also received very disparate information about what to expect of their child's hospitalization from a length of stay perspective. Their referring pediatrician or their referring cardiologist were referring them uh, and telling them to expect a certain degree of hospitalization. Uh, and that conflicted with what we found the, the providers who were taking care of them to have in terms of their mental constructs. And so we, the other thing we started asking is how do we learn uh, in terms of if we wanted to tackle variation um, and we started noticing that as we, uh, how we learn as healthcare providers is we really do focus significantly on kind of our visible failures um, when it comes to either morbidities or mortalities. Those are the patients we really talk about to a, a large degree, but we really never talk about patients who just kind of um, go through the system without major complications. In fact, that's where variation really lies. And so if we really wanted to tackle variation, kind of have to tackle this invisible layer of patients who've gone through um, with very different performances in length of stay, uh, albeit no failures associated with them. Um, and so that's kind of the genesis of, of target-based care, taking those types of observations and principles. And we hypothesized that if we took a candidate operation like Tetralogy of Fallot, and we dived into the electronic health record uh, and looked at those invisible patients who just kind of went through without any failures and, and try to learn from them in terms of what their typical time on the ventilator was, their typical time in the ICU, and their typical time in the hospital. Um, and then from there, we um, uh, hypothesized that if we just set a goal based on that historical uh, aggregate experience, um, perhaps uh, we can then start to all share in the same mental model uh, about what that goal is, uh, whether it's uh, how to get off the ventilator in a certain time or transfer out of the ICU or transfer out of the hospital. Um, and that goal would not be necessarily a consensus derived process, but more of a data driven process uh, based on the local data that's within the local healthcare ecosystem within our uh, Stanford community. And so um, these would be benchmarks that are internally derived. Um, and we hypothesize by being transparent with these targets, um, the patients uh, and the providers would have a shared mental model towards uh, achieving that goal. And this is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's un undergone a couple of iterations, um, but it's literally a simple um, intervention, which is a placard that is uh, posted at the bedside of the patient where we round and where we make decisions about the cadence of how we uh, wean therapies or titrate therapies. And the goals are posted up there in terms of when to consider extubation, when to consider transfer out of the ICU, and when to transfer out of the hospital. And the providers then see this and we don't tell them what to do. We don't give them a script. We don't give them uh, a stepwise approach to do it. We simply rely on their content expertise uh, to be able to guide their patients to these goals. Um, and so that's, that's the premise of target-based care. It's, it's not a pathway per se in terms of being prescriptive. It's much more uh, providing information about historical patients who have undergone very similar surgeries uh, and, and to be able to make them transparent in real time, uh, to be able to see if that would impact how providers practice uh, and, and give them a little bit more information about what is achievable in terms of goals of care. Um, and so it's, it's really the, the fundamental pr principles of promoting a mutual understanding of a situation, uh, creating the commonality of effort and purpose, um, uh, having a shared mental model promotes more effective communication and enables pra better practice changes. And for us as a system could potentially promote better prediction and anticipation, especially when it comes to bed management and flows, um, and, and also for better enabling of um, monitoring for uh, continuous improvements, especially when patients um, may deviate uh, either positively or negatively from, from those goals. So I'm going to pass it on to Claudia now to kind of talk and walk us through the results. Thanks, Andy. So if you consider the intervention and our um, attempt to understand its impact, our family of measures really mirrors the targets that are set by uh, the target-based care intervention. So our outcome measures look at ventilator duration, ICU, length of stay, total post-op hospital days, 
as well as central line days. Um, and in order to measure the inclusivity of the intervention, for example, is this only an intervention that can target standard risk patients, or is it more inclusive and useful to a larger population? We look at the uh, frequency of inclusion uh, and the frequency of discontinuance. And this also lets us understand if we are being adherent, you know, if we're enrolling the patients appropriately or we're missing patients. Um, a balancing measure to understand um, potential unintended consequences. We look at re rates of reintubation, um, 48 hours ICU readmission, and 30 day readmission rate. And where, you know, this was piloted initially with 10 cardiac surgeries, the program now includes over 40 surgeries representing seven service lines as you can see here. And to highlight some of the results that we've seen, um, this is a, a two-year experience or two years um, after the initiation of target-based care within the cardiology division. And I'll show you the anatomy of this slide. So here we're borrowing from the methodology of an observed expected ratio. But since we, you know, part of this intervention is that we don't really know the expected length of stay. We're using our median length of stay as defined by the target-based care intervention as our expected. So we're looking here at, a, at an observed median ratio where each point represents a consecutive patient across time. And the left side in light blue represents the pre-intervention or baseline period. And in the dark blue, is represented the post-intervention period after PDC launch. So you can see that, um, and then if the points are uh, below the zero line, that means that a patient was discharged before their median target. If the patient or the point is above the center line, then that patient stayed longer than the median. So that's sort of the anatomy of the chart. And if you look across um, the baseline period, the points appear more disparate, um, wider um, in, in its distribution, and there are more, more points above the median line. If you look um, at the post-intervention period, you can see that the points overall look closer together, which translates into a reduction in variability, more patients meeting or beating that median target. And you can see that there is a density of patients also um, below that zero median line. And this really translated into about two and a half days reduction in aggregate post-op median length, mean length of stay. Um, here we're looking at results for a four-year period within a neurosurgical population of, that includes five different surgeries. And you can see a very similar trend. This is showing us variation in observed to expected, or as we discussed, median, observed to median ratio in length of post-op ICU on this day for those five aggregate surgeries. And again, you see a pretty similar trend. The four target-based care, you see points that are more disparate and widespread, representing higher variability. Um, and then as you move to the right, you see that the points are much closer to the me median line, um, much closer together, representing reduction in variability, and also representing more patients that are beating their target, meaning they're staying shorter time uh, as compared to the median. And again, this translated into a mean reduction in length of stay from 2.1 days or two days to one and a half days. One particularly useful application of target-based care is really as using it as a tool for continuous improvement and using it to reverse engineer clinical pathways. So Andy, at the beginning of the talk, talked about, you know, we have really trust in clinical pathways, um, but at least in pediatrics, um, there are many uh, potential diagnoses and surgeries where there just isn't great, great evidence. So here we have a situation in which we can use target-based care 
and the experience that we're learning from these patients to understand what are the specific factors associated with prolonged length of stay, and what are the specific factors associated with shorter length of stay. And then using that information, redesign or reverse engineer a clinical pathway that can, for example, include anticipatory guidance warning against these factors that um, are associated with adverse length of stay and promoting um, the factors that are associated with better length of stay. And ultimately, it translates into a, a situation where it really promotes a continuous learning system in which, with the absence of evidence, we can take our own internal experience um, in an aggregate fashion using our electronic health record data and in the absence of an evidence-based evidence system, create a practice-based evidence system. So given our um, promising experience within cardiology, and then with other service lines at Lucio Packer Children's Hospital, we wanted to understand really, is our local problem also a national problem? And if so, is there a potential to um, try to understand if this tool could be generalized to other centers um, within cardiology and outside of cardiology? We have the benefit of a, a registry called Pediatric Cardiac Critical Care Consortium, uh, which is a um, ICU-based uh, network for improvement. And we brought together about 10 centers from participating in PC4 Collaborative in a summit at Stanford in 2019, in May of 2019, to understand really, number one, go through our experience and share our learnings, and then understand if this group of individuals would be interested in undergoing a, a multi-center learning collaborative to understand if our pilot experience was potentially generalizable across multiple centers. And we, we initially envisioned that we would have interest uh, of about five centers or so, and we would pilot a, a, a small group of surgeries within those five centers. And we were impressed and motivated and a little bit daunted that there were actually multiple centers who really this work resonated with them. They, they were equally sharing in the problem of variability, of lack of evidence in creation of prescribed clinical pathways. And they were very interested in examining the generalizability of this tool and not only the generalizability of it, but the specific application of the tool uh, within their own local cultures. And so here we are uh, sort of in the middle of our journey toward dissemination and have now um, initiated a multi-center learning collaborative among the PC4 group. Here's where we are, we have uh, really the benefit of having a really incredible team in Cardiac Networks United that in, includes a data team as well as a quality improvement leadership team. And we've partnered with a, another institution that is also um, uh, ha, has an experience of target-based care sort of in parallel with ours um, in uh, primary children. So you can see on the right, we're showing uh, a scorecard, if you will, of progression of the target-based care intervention in terms of onboarding and then monthly data reports, just to show you that there are 18 participating centers within the collaborative that is now launched since October of 2020. Here is our key driver diagram. You can see um, it's interesting because Initially, when we started piloting this work in, in cardiology, we, our primary goal was to reduce variation. But we also, as an outcome metric, looked at absolute length of stay. And when we 
had our summit and we were trying to determine um, what will be our smart aim for our aggregate group. We also found that most centers also um, felt that uh, focusing on variation as a primary outcome and the reduction of that variation was really the right way to go, also with an eye to reduce the overall length of stay. So our SMART aim is to decrease variation in post-op length of stay for pediatric surgical patients undergoing four surgeries, and we've chosen four surgeries of mixed complexity um, by an aggregate of 20% um, reduction in the standard deviation of length of stay from our baseline 24-month period to a prospective 24-month period. Our key drivers are shown here, and they're really <clears throat> aligned with our major principles of target-based care, which are to promote a shared mental model, um, have that shared mental model represented transparently at the point of care for providers and families to see, um, promote care autonomy, so not really being prescriptive about how to get to those outcomes, but showing that they are achievable based on the fact that our the median population has achieved that, and providing a, a promoting an intervention which can adapt to the local culture. And the interventions are really to determine, uh, as Andy Menstock showed you in one of the slides, to determine the target length of stay based on the median for each surgery, and then to enroll eligible patients, deploy the target card at the bedside, and then really start to learn from each other on how different teams are applying and enhancing the target-based care work. To share some scholarly activity that derived from our journey through um, the exploration of clinical pathway work, the transition, if you will, initially to target-based care work and where we are now, here are three papers that, um, two papers that have been published, uh, and one showing our um, lessons from our initial part of uh, the of flow clinical pathway work. Uh, subsequent to that, a paper that shows the two-year experience within cardiology, um, where we see a clear reduction in variation for post-op length of stay across several surgeries. Uh, and uh, related to the uh, promotion of situational awareness, awareness around targets, we are currently exploring uh, within the multi-center collaborative a survey to understand how are, um, in the early experience of the multi-center collaborative, how do people view the, um, the current practice around uh, length of stay for different, different populations, um, different surgeries. For example, when we survey uh, several individuals, uh, nurses, acute care, um, APPs, cardiologists, are all people going to predict a length of stay that's equal or is it going to be disparate, such as we found in our experience? And so uh, hopefully we've shown you an example of our, uh, within our target-based care program, um, of a program that is grounded in learning the most effective and sustainable models to reduce unnecessary variation while maintaining and improving excellent outcomes for patients. We focus on achieving value um, in our current healthcare system by using a data-driven and transparent approach. These are some tenets of our target-based care program um, that uh, I hope we've been able to show during this talk. We focus on reduction of unnecessary variation as a real prime, uh, a primary driver to value, maintaining improved, uh, and improving excellent clinical outcomes, being good stewards of resource utilization, and in promoting flow and improving operational productivity, 
as well as being good stewards of scientific and discovery and innovation. We'll highlight our team here. This is you know, Andy and I are our only representatives of a very large team, some of which are shown here that uh, both serve as innovators and uh, and uh, operationalists of target-based care within our organization and beyond. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Claudia and Andy, uh, and congratulations on your success with this program. And thank you for presenting it here today. Um, we will open up for questions and maybe I can start off with one as we're waiting for more to come in. Um, and Claudia, I'm relationship between target-based care and pathways in the sense of uh, the opportunity to reverse engineer um, clinical pathways from data that you acquire through target-based care. But as you're a leader in both areas, uh, you know, what, what is your current stance on the relationship uh, between the two uh, approaches and when to shift from one to the other, either one way or the other? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think that one is evolving within our respect in this domain here. Um, I think there are several ways that, um, that that could be tackled. One way that I think is very effective, for example, is to, for example, to start in a, in a population where you can very clearly define the cohort. So surgical population is very amenable to something like target-based care because you can clearly define the specific cohort that has a cadence. Then one approach that I think is particularly useful is to start with target-based care, where you really try to understand um, with these major milestones that a patient needs to go through to successfully get home um, and, and to their families, which is what we ultimately want of, of these patients. And if it shows, if we find that just by promoting a, um, a shared mental model of an achievable benchmark, right, actually doing target-based care, we find that there is a narrow variability. So just by doing that, we're able to reduce the variability and, um, and see a improvement or a stabilization of length of stay, then perhaps that population doesn't need a clinical pathway because individuals are able to use the target-based care benchmark as a way to, uh, you know, um, uh, to change or modify their practice to try to make meet those targets without having to prescribe those. Contrary to that. There are several areas where we've seen that using the same methodology, we're not able to move the needle on reduction of variability. We're not able to see a, a stabilization on variation. And it is in those populations where I think reverse engineering clinical pathways is extremely useful because you can really look, you know, if, if you recall the chart, my favorite slide that Andy shows where you, you look at the experience from every single patient that doesn't represent invisible failures, but has a lot of rich information. If we start to look at, at those groups very, very clearly and understand where are those components that then we can create clinical pathways for, that is where we can, um, place our focus and really go through the large funnel and really being clear about what is the evidence if there's in both in the literature and from our own patients and then create clinical pathways in, in order to understand if what are, what are the areas that we do need to prescribe care in. So I think that's one of the areas, at least in surgical populations, that is, is the way that I am thinking uh, we'll be able to approach clinical pathway work and target-based care work. The other area that I think um, is, is an area that we haven't explored so much with target-based care is in the medical population of patients. And in the medical population of patients, it's, it's often, we're often dealing with heterogeneous populations 
that have a common problem that is leading them to come into the hospital. And in that case, it's very difficult to cohort those patients into like a patient like mine, in which case perhaps the clinical pathway is really the more, um, the more relevant route. Thank you, uh, Claudia, for uh, uh, your thoughts on that. Steve Ash had a question. Steve, do you want to ask your question? Well, surely, uh, Claudia, Claudia and Andy, I've admired your work from afar. It's really great to see it presented. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Um, I'm uh, an adult um, uh, primary care uh, physician, but I'm very, very interested in kind of the science of how to make organizational change. Um, I think of it as very strongly based in a relatively nascent field of implementation science. And this allows us to derive generalizable lessons from the kind of amazing work that you guys are doing. I, I wonder if you, I wonder to what extent you have already incorporated some of these implementation science frameworks into your work. That's a, it's a great question. I think, I think, um... Some of the theories uh, behind implementation science uh, really speaks to the differences uh, between uh, implementation climate and uh, constructs such as organizational climate or culture. Um, and, and, and those two sometimes have to be reconciled in order for implementation to be really successful. Um, and I think that really played true when it came to trying to uh, kind of develop pathways. Um, and for, for us, um, and to build on what Claudia was saying, you know, Pathways, I think, has a very distinct role, um, and it's very clear that it's very successful, um, but it does come with a lot of push-pull in certain areas. In other areas, it's really easy for pathways to be successful in implementation. Um, you know, if I wanted to have a feeding protocol, it's, it's better not to have that in my memory banks. It's better to have a pathway or a protocol associated with someone ramping up on nutritional feeds in the ICU, um, um, whereas... Um, pathways for kind of the overall management of patients um, is a very difficult concept to, to, to get behind. Uh, again, speaking to not only the biological diversity of the patient in terms of how they present, but also in terms of the diversity of training that, that providers undergo and how, uh, how disparate some of those concepts are. So I think, I think that's um, some of the difficulties in implementing pathways under that type of ecosystem. Um, for us, I think the implementation uh, kind of theories uh, related to climate, uh, especially when it comes to innovation, um, uh, some of the classic theories behind or the determinant fact, uh, frameworks behind implementation theories are a little bit more amenable to um, just simply providing information to providers and seeing how that information really affects behavioral changes. And that's kind of the, the principles behind target-based care is to take uh, information and make it transparent and available in real time at the moment of decision making. Um, and that's fundamentally what it is. Um, and it speaks a little bit to, I think, organizational readiness. Um, and for us, um, providers were asking for this information from the get-go. They, they all want to be uh, aware of their practice and, and how that practice benchmarks against other, um, other experiences. And I think this has been shown um, time and time again in terms of bringing situational awareness to surgeons in terms of how long it takes for them to do um, a, a particular operation, for example, and how it compares to their peers. Simply providing that type of information has led to improvements without having to be prescriptive um, utilizing pathways. So I think um, applications of pathways are very clear uh, and very clearly beneficial in, in a large part of what we do. Um, but the simple prov provision of information uh, and having the theory tested that that information will provide to better care um, or better changes in behavior and having that being able to be sustained um, and scalable is something I think that's uh, important for, um, for us as kind of lessons within the target-based care journey. I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but it, but it is meant to kind of demonstrate that there is um, a, a difference in when, when implementing um, uh, and, and using the set frameworks of implementation is to help with kind of um, the, the economics behind behavioral changes amongst physicians. And I think it was Atul Gawande who said it best, you know, one of the things that physicians and healthcare providers in general cherish the most is their autonomy and pathways go right up against that. Um, whereas target-based care, I think to some degree preserves autonomy 
um, but simply just provides information. And I think it borrows some of those frameworks of, of implementation science. I'd be happy to talk to you guys more about it some other time, but thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Andy. Uh, we had another question uh, from Don Hoffman, uh, wondering the impact of target-based care. Yeah, this is something that we um, consternated about um, uh, over and over again, especially when uh, patients um, uh, it's, uh, who were, you know, the, the children of families uh, who are watching and and viewing these uh, these cards that show these targets, um, how they would respond when the when their child did not meet the targets um, and stayed a little longer in the ICU or stayed longer in the hospital overall, um, and so. Part of what Claudia and I did um, initially in, in this pilot experience was, was to go around and talk to every family um, and, and, and see what their experience was. Uh, in addition to that, um, we also sent out surveys uh, on post-op day seven and on post-op day 30. Um, and we didn't share the data just because of a lack of time, but um, to the point where patients did not meet their targets um, and stayed longer or on the ventilator or on the ICU, um, when we talked with the families, it was interesting. Um, uh, the families uh, were never, well, the, I should say the patients never stayed longer on the ventilator or in the ICU because of negligence or because of an error or things like that. It was always justified by some sort of medical reasoning uh, and it's usually biologically based. And so the targets, um, specifically when the patients didn't meet them, uh, served as kind of a nice focal point for having much more relevant conversations at the bedside between the healthcare providers and the families. Um, your child was not being able to be extubated because we've noticed important atelectasis and the lungs just weren't ready. Um, so that was, that was an important um, point where I think the conversations, because you had a shared expectation, uh, was much more relevant and targeted. Um, and it was much more, um, I think, able to uh, uh, address and directly uh, point to some of the concerns that the families might have that may have been glossed over if those shared expectations weren't there to begin with. Um, and so our satisfaction scores uh, for, for, for families who were a part of the target-based care program were actually superior to what the baseline uh, patient experience scores were afterwards, especially to the questions of whether or not your, your child was ready to be discharged or you felt ready that uh, your patient was to be discharged. Um, so that was, that was um, something that we continued to, uh, to think about and focus. But for the most part, I think um, the targets really served as a great point of having much more relevant and targeted conversations at the bedside and that, um, and that having that shared mental model and that shared expectation really promoted um, that, kind of, um, that kind of conversation. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and uh, there are uh, several other questions in the chat, but I think we are at time at 12.50. So unfortunately, we'll have to stop and let people have plenty of time to get to where they have to be next. Um, uh, Claudia and Andy, thanks again uh, for a great presentation. And thanks for every to everybody for their time and participation in today's event. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.